let's move on. We've got a few things to talk about tonight. And uh, I'm going to share my screen with you in a minute here and go over a few things. Uh, you may have seen me looking away. I'm taking attendance here the hard way. Um, I'm actually uh, using paper. Yeah. Rich, if you get another request, if you get another request to join, uh, sign in so I can see who all is here. Does that make any sense? No. <clears throat> we can see you <laughs> and we can hear you and so uh, okay we got everybody else's or almost everybody else's mic is turned off and that's okay um, feel free to jump in anytime you want uh, let me see here all right, Norm, I'm letting you in again. This is only the third okay, time, good. not bad. Hey, this way I can <laughs> see who, who's here. I can only see you on the, on the, I can rest of you up on my computer. There. There you go. All right. You really do need a new computer, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> sort of an inside joke, folks. Anyway, um, not too much has been going on from, from National. Uh, they're working on a number of things, uh, including budgets for next year, and preparing to, to close the books on uh, 2020. And uh, so that's keeping them pretty busy. They're also working on the new phase-in plan for reopening the program. And we haven't heard many details about that, um, I think they're being very optimistic from the things that I've heard, uh, which is great. I hope they come true. Um, but considering how we're spiking around the country with more, uh, more people getting sick, I think it's going to be delayed. However, uh, putting the plans in place once the numbers are right is critical, obviously. And they're working very hard on those plans so that when things look like they're ready to go, then we will be ready to go. And I think that's a positive. Um, you know, I'm sure you've all been watching the news and you, you see the increase in, in numbers around the world, literally, not just here in the States. Um, and the, the news about the vaccines and all that kind of stuff. So we can only hope and pray that uh, that all comes to being and, and we can get back to something called normal, whatever that might be. Um, so ha that having been said, let's jump into a few things. I'm going to share my screen and I'm gonna show you a couple of different things. And <coughs> see here. All right, you should be seeing my email account and seeing a Healing Waters logo in the middle. Is that what you see? Yes. Yep. Good. All right. This is, uh, I'm going to open this up a little bit here so you can see it a little bit better. This is an email that comes out weekly, and you should all be getting it if you're registered in CM. <laughs> yes, I want to dismiss that. Um, this news and notes email comes out um, usually at least once a week, and there's a lot of really good information. If you're not getting it, then send an, inf uh, an email to info at projecthealingwaters.org and they will put you on the list, assuming that you are registered in CRM. Okay, whoops. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I did it again. Okay, here we go. Um, a lot of things. Do you want us to go to New York and 
Zoom, huh? What was that? There's a email wanting the thoughts to Zoom to the uh, yeah, New York. I got that today. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple of them that come out each, uh, a couple of times a week. And uh, so you can read these articles in here. And this is the one about the uh, fly rod building competition. And Frank is uh, in that competition in the beginners group. Uh, he did great in the fly tying. So now he's after uh, another one in the rod building and everyone is allowed to vote for them. And I'll, uh, if you go you here go, right. and you click on read more, it will take you to the voting page and you can vote for Frank and his rod. He's done a great job. There's a message in here from Veterans Day and there's a spectacular fly that somebody made. It's been around a while and it's a, it's a beautiful job, that's for sure. Um, and this year or coming up in this month is the 245th birthday of the Marine Corps. And there's a story about that. Hoorah. And one of our favorite videos, it'll take you to uh, a YouTube page that has a lot of uh, videos that are pertaining to fly fishing and also specifically to the program. Uh, and Project Healing Waters. So you can take a look at that. And then here's the announcement of the winners for the fly tying competition. And you can check that out. Again, Frank won third place on that. Yeah. Um, congratulations, Frank. Great job. Rich, all I'm seeing is your email. There's lots of things like fundraising update. That looks pretty good. I, that beats what I had for dinner. Uh, there's always some, uh, some fundraising going on. Giving Tuesday is December 1st this year, and that's a nationwide thing for raising money for the program. And Freedom Ranch Coffee, you can get a uh, $5 of the purchase if you buy a, a pound of their coffee, which I hear is pretty darn good. You can get um, some of the money will be donated to Project Healing Waters. Then Amazon Smile, I don't know if uh, many of you are aware of this, but if you register with smile.amazon, a portion of whatever you buy on Amazon will go to the charity of your choice. And of course, we're thinking about Project Healing Waters. Uh, it is a small percentage, but if a lot of people do it, it adds up pretty quickly. And um, I believe they pay that out quarterly and they, it's working pretty good for them. And so if you're buying on Amazon anyway, if you register as smile or go on as smile.amazon.com, then that portion of whatever you're, you're purchasing immediately goes or eventually gets to Project Healing Waters. So that's that commercial. And there's special t-shirts that they're doing some uh, make a donation things and some pictures, etc. So uh, here's some information on the COVID situation from Veteran Affairs and more stories about Project Healing Water. So there's a lot of good information in there. And if you're not getting this already, as they say, info at projecthealingwaters.org will get you signed up. And so you can check that out. I'm going to get out of that one. And then there was another one that came out same day, a couple of hours before. And that too was um, specifically about the uh, rod building competition. And as it says here, one day left, okay, the, it ends tomorrow. If you got this email, all you have to do is just click on vote. That'll take you to the voting page and you can vote for Frank and his rod. So that's the story on that one. 
and then there's more information about the rock building company program so that's what we've got there let me have a second here to check somebody off on my list there we go all right so that's enough email stuff i think that's all i've got for you yep those are the two that i wanted to show you on that and um, has to log in <laughs> What's that? Only 25 minutes to log in. Uh-oh. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, glad you made it. Um, I sent out a list, looks similar to this, without the colors the other day with the email for some of the equipment that we've got in, uh, in storage. And all this color marking here indicates people have already responded to that. Uh, for that surplus equipment. And if you want some of it, uh, just let me know. I'm doing this on a first come, first serve basis. Whoever speaks up first gets their choice. Uh, so there's still quite a bit of good equipment. There's a lot of things that are not on there as well. So if you don't see a rod that you're interested in, let me know because there's more of them that are in storage and I can certainly, uh, I have to put together more a more complete list, but this will get us started. We have quite a few people that are interested in this gear. Um, as an as a footnote on loaning equipment and uh, giving away some of this equipment, anything that has to do with your being either on or in the water, you will not be able to borrow any of that equipment unless you have completed your water, water certifications for that equipment. That should have been made clear before, but it wasn't. And I goofed. Okay, simple as that. Um, so if you want to use waders, you need to have your up-to-date waiter certification as an example. Okay. I know that a lot of people's certifications have expired, and that's simply because we haven't done any this year, okay? And there were a lot that were coming up for recertification. And when the weather warms up again and we can do that kind of an event, then certainly water certifications will be high on our priority list. Okay, so that's the story on that. And if you're interested in any of the, that equipment or similar, just let me know. Now, I'm gonna talk about a couple of other resources that are available. I have a question. Um, one of the guys sent me this link. I had completely forgotten about this company called Fly Shack. They've been around for a long time and they have a hatch charts page. These people sell flies, okay? It's as simple as that. However, if you, they have got a listing for every state in the country, okay? It's some of the most popular, well, most, almost every state, a lot of them. Uh, almost, um, sorry, a lot of the different waters within the state. And for instance, if we look at Arizona, and look at the East Fork of the Black River, it will give you an idea of what flies you can fish on Rich. that water. And Rich. When you catch Rich. If, Rich, if you're showing something, we're not seeing it. I'm just seeing an email yeah. for the beginning rod building. I'm not right. seeing the list that you're trying to share. Huh. Well, I put that away already. And mm -hmm. now I'm on to something else. And <laughs> well, maybe you put it away. Well, let me see here. What's happening? Very interesting. Okay. And Mary had a question for you also. Yeah, actually, he started actually already answering it about the certification. So, oh. hmm. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Hello again. And then oh. I'm going to start that over. 
and see if we can manage to get the right thing there. We can always blame this on Norm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there I should go. have ah. something on there that there says we go. patch charts. All right. We're making progress. See, I'm just too fast for the computer, that's all. <laughs> okay, anyway, as I say, you know, if we click on like the Black River, it shows you what hatches will be coming up, when they will be, okay? And if you click on, for instance, this blue winged olive, it will bring you to a page that shows you all kinds of flies that will simulate a blue winged olive hatch. Wow. And you can go to them and look at all the different uh, types of them. And if you want to buy some, if you click on, for instance, this uh, first one here, the spinner, you pick the size that you want, and it'll give you the price. You can order any, uh, any that they have available. It shows some that are out of stock. If you look at this one over here, which is really cool, it also tells you those that are out of stock when they will ship. And at 89 cents a piece, <laughs> it's a really good deal for some of these flies, especially when you're getting down into the 22s and 24 sizes that are really hard to tie yourself. 89 cents is a steal. Okay, if you went to Orvis, you'd pay two and a half, probably 250 for it. You might get them at uh, Sportsman's Warehouse for $1.29 if you buy a dozen, you know, that kind of thing. So the, the pricing is very good. And uh, I bought some from them a few years ago and the quality was good. And so this is a great resource. And just to be able to get to, to the first page here without going even any further than that, um, it's really a good source of information. Um, it doesn't cover every waterway within the state, and it obviously doesn't cover every state, but uh, a lot of them. And it's, uh, it's a real good uh, source of information here. So I want to tell you about that. Again, that's Fly Shack and Hatch Charts. Okay, they also have a lot of stuff for rod building and fly tying, materials, equipment, etc. So, Real good source of information right there. You okay. seem to have again still though. All Sorry, I didn't hear you. They seem to have a prejudice and still water moving. Yep. Yep. All right. I'm gonna move on here. Hopefully you're going to now see our YouTube page. Is that on your screens? Good. Yeah. I have added some uh, some more videos here to our favorite videos. As I showed you last time, there were only a couple in there. Now we have a few more, and I wanted to just go over those real quickly. And then the uh, star attraction for tonight is not me talking. It's going to be Bill Larson. So he's coming up. All right, some of the healing waters uh, ones we already saw, uh, these videos, like for the ones at Silver Creek that was produced by Game and Fish, uh, the five steps to landing more fish, urban carp, we saw that last time. The ones that I've added start here. Uh, sea Hunter is a TV show, cable TV show, that uh, mostly focuses on waters in Florida in and around that part of the country. However, the guy that runs the thing, his name is Rob something or other, um, also went to um, the ranch in Montana. And this particular episode here that's called God's Country is about Freedom Ranch in Colorado. Okay, and uh, it's a pretty darn good video. He's done a nice job of it. Um, the next one is not at Freedom Ranch, but it is also about healing waters. 
And so you can see some of those stories. Those are really good. Uh, the next few that I put, to, put in here were on basic fly casting. Uh, and I put three different videos in here to give you an idea of how different they can be, for one thing. Uh, the first one is with Joan Wolf, and she teaches the basics, as it says here. Uh, she's considered to be one of the best teachers for fly casting, a uh, very accomplished woman, and uh, her videos are very good. And when you go, to one like so. If you haven't gotten anything for free today, now's your chance. Right now, if you order your four week. This is a basic cast, taking line off the water, letting it unroll behind. And you'll see that there are other. Uh, videos, for instance, this one with Winston Rods, that are also uh, videos that she's produced. Okay, so you can go on from there to learn more about it. And of course, there's just dozens of people out there that are teaching casting. But the reason why I chose these three, the next one being with uh, Cinda Howard. Okay, and she talks about it. Our goal is to move this to rod it. in a straight line so the line goes out straight. So I want to move my... She does a really good job with her videos as well. And then the third one down here in the bottom is the very first... instructors. The reason why I gave you only one of each of these is to let you sample them and see which ones look good to you. One of the things that you can get yourself in trouble with on this stuff is too many different videos. If you start to look at all the different ones that are out there, you are going to get confused, okay? So take a sample of these, decide if you like one of, the, of them more than the others, and then just stay with that instructor. And I think you'll have a lot better success with them. All of them are good. All of them are different. But you can find one that kind of fits uh, your style that you can hear and you can understand and uh, just stick with those. Okay. So that's what I've added in there. And they're, again, they're on our... I've got to do a little something there, get things moved around. And again, this is all on our favorite videos playlist on our Phoenix program, Flight Tying and Fishing YouTube channel. Okay. Any questions on any of that? So uh, to get on this, we put in Project Healing Waters, Phoenix Fly Fishing, YouTube. Is that the drill? You can, or I have sent you the link in many emails. Okay, we, so if you look back, Mike, uh, I sent one out on Sunday night and I referenced it. Uh, okay. So all you have to do is you can pick it up right out of the email. It's this address here and it will put you right onto this page. And you'll notice that there's a little icon up here in the corner, which is a uh, pheasant tail nymph. So that, if it happens that you, it gets you to that point, um, it may bring you to the home page, in which case you just click on playlists and then it will show you all the videos that we have in here and i've got them under just three different categories right now okay okay thank you all right um any other questions or comments yes one yeah would would you please every time we're going to have a meeting that afternoon resend the link just 
just I can do it. that. Um, I sent it out on Sunday for that reason. Okay, if, we, if you want, I can send it out the afternoon as well. Um, I know there's been some issues with Zoom uh, sending out the invitations. And what's strange about them is if you click on the invitation when you get it in your email, especially if you say accept, it disappears from your email, from your inbox in your email and moves it to your calendar. So if you don't know that, I'm going to switch here again. Let me see. Do you come? Oops. Screen sharing is stopped. Okay. Let's try that again. Um, here's my email again. And it the invitation for this thing shows up only in my calendar not in the email. So if you're not using an electronic calendar like this, this one is in Outlook, it may just go into space someplace and you won't be able to find it. That's why I sent the link out on Sunday that had the same information. So I will certainly send it out the same day as well if they, if you think that'll help. I'd be happy. It actually, it's easy to do. When I accepted it, it actually put it into trash. <laughs> well, I, I feel better treated. about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know I've been trashed. <laughs> Interesting. Some of this stuff, I've got trouble with my phone right now. I've got Outlook on my phone also, and I have emails that I see on the phone. I read them, and before I get a chance to reply to them, sometimes they just disappear. They are nowhere in my phone account anymore, but they're here in Outlook on my computer. It's a mystery. Anyway. Isn't it a wonder? What's that? Technology is a wonder. Oh, it is. It is a puzzle. Yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily wonderful, but uh, it's a wonder. I think you got your settings wrong in your uh, server to get it to let get it after you looked at. That's probably true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that happens. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's about all I've got for you tonight, um, and I'm going to turn it over to Bill. And Bill, whenever you're ready, you can take over. Give it to me. <laughs> I think you've already got it. All you need to do is share your screen. Two old guys with technology. Here we go. Yep. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> so I can do it, Mike. <laughs> Something's happening. Hey, here we are. Yay. Can you see it? Can you see this? Yes. We see meeting opening thoughts. There we go. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, the last time we I talked about fishing locations, I talked about North Peoria over at Paloma Pond, Avondale Friendship Pond, and Gilbert Regional Park Pond. Did anybody fish any of those? I guess not. Not yet. <laughs> yes. Not yet. I did one. The the new Peoria one. Off yeah. Lake Pleasant Highway. Okay, I can't tell who's saying. That's Magda. Oh, okay. I, I did I did the new Peoria one off Lake Pleasant. Oh, okay. Did you catch anything? No, because I left half my gear, so I ended up just sitting there. Oh, uh, it's a pretty so, park, and I was and there I yesterday, and I was using this fly, which you probably can't see, but it's a little zebra midge, mm -hmm. and I caught eight, I caught five 18-inch trout. Oh, really? Oh, yes. And then I also caught one on a PTO. Huh. So, 
they that was put North incentive, Peoria? They put incentive-sized trout into Paloma Pond. And I was totally amazed. Has anybody been fishing anywhere else? So we can keep them, right? Yes, they are. You can keep them. Mm -hmm. I let mine go. Um, oh, good. So I can go tomorrow and catch them. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Yeah. Now, when you first get there on the south side of the lake, there is a railing, like a like a little barrier, and there's a pile of rocks in out from the right hand side of that, the east side. And if you fish just the other side of those rocks with about four feet of leader and tip it and a strike indicator and the wind is blowing in your face, <laughs> it worked really well. Um, I was up at Woods Canyon with Mark last week. Uh, the, the Canyon store is closed. Uh, there are no boats available right now. There's no camping available. There's less people to interfere with you. And, uh, but once the, the road is closed in there, it will be closed all winter long. They won't reopen it. So if you want to go right now, uh, the, the lake is hot. It, uh, it's producing a lot of fish. And the fly that I like to use up there is about a size 12 olive woolly bugger. That works rather well. And then, uh, you know, you've always got the uh, Willow Springs access available. But I was able last week to catch my first ever tiger trout, and then I caught three more. And they're down by the boat launch, which is, if you can see my arrow, is right about here on the lake. And that is a wonderful little spot in this little cove, too. Pledger was in the cove and then over by the boat launch fishing from shore or just wading in knee deep and he caught a bunch of fish too. So it's a great fishing location. Moving right along, um, we're basically gonna talk about selecting a fly fishing rod and how do you choose one. It's, uh, it's difficult sometimes to figure out what it is you wanna use, um, but in Arizona, if you're fishing strictly Arizona waters, uh, it kind of narrows it down to some really easy choices. Um, you know, rods come in, in weight, line weight classes from zero to 15 and maybe a few more now. Um, uh, your rods can be say six feet long or up to 15 feet long uh, as a specialty rod. Um, a longer rod, like a nine foot or a nine and a half foot, is good if you're floating on the water in a float tube or if you're uh, in a boat or on a kayak. Gets that fly a little further away from you, makes it easier to make a good cast. Uh, the mid-range rod is probably a five weight rod, and you can use that rod like we have for project heating water rods anywhere in the state for any kind of fish. Um, it will do anything you want to do. Um, there are, in the originals, there were um, slow rods. Actually, the first ones were kind of stiff. They were made out of wood. And then they made rods out of bamboo that they stripped down and made into little sections. And it made it much lighter. And it's a very slow rod or a traditional casting style. Um, you need to wait for the line to recycle. Or what I mean by that is on the back cast, you wait till the line wait, backs up straight and then you go forward it's a much more uh, smooth casting style it's not an abrupt casting style um, a lot of the new stuff is made with um, graphite and you can get traditional style rods that are made with graphite and you can also get uh, a very uh, stiff casting rod made with graphite and uh, but the thing I would really encourage you to do if you're looking to get a rod is buy it in a combination with a rod, reel, line, and backing. And that's the, the best price point that you're going to find when you're trying to get started. Uh, it uh, makes it too as to how long, how often you're going to fish. Um, this kind of illustrates, it's a scout we had in one of the uh, AFC classes. And uh, you can see how he's got the, the thumb on the top of the, the uh, handle, and he's... Uh, 
uh, got that loaded loaded rod ready to send that line out. I, I thought that was an I don't know how I actually got that photograph. It really turned out nice. But you can see how the rod is ready to propel that line forward out into a biscuit tank. And he caught a fish right there. Um, so the line is the important thing. If you're going to cast <clears throat> and decide what you want to cast, you pick a line first. Then a five weight line being good, then get a five weight rod and a reel that actually fits that as well. Um, if you're going to be fishing in Arizona, again, the five weight, it works really well. Uh, somehow, the right hand side of my screen has got our pictures on it. I wonder if there's a way I can show that, well, whatever. Um, yeah, Bill, if you hover over the picture that's on the top, you'll see a minimized bar in the top uh, band. Oh. So Thank you, you very much. Try okay. That. Yeah, it works good. Um, you know, your normal size of fish you're going to go after, if you want to go after a little tiny fish, uh, your sunfishes and your, your small trout, you know, you can go with a lighter rod, but you can fish them just as easily with a five weight rod. Um, if you're going to be going out of state or even in state and hiring a guide, they usually provide the rods and the flies and everything for you. You don't have to worry about that. Um, my personal choice when I'm fishing is either a four or five weight. I like to use a four weight most of the time. Um, uh, typically, the, the first rod people get is, is a two-piece rod. And each piece is like uh, four feet long and uh, they join with just one ferrule in the middle. Uh, but if you're gonna travel at all, uh, what I have to do is get a four section rod and uh, a tube, and you can actually check it in on the airlines with your carry-on luggage. Um, if you're gonna be buying a used rod, make sure you look it over really well, because you don't want a rod that's been beat up and has uh, cracks in it or stress marks. Um, cast them if it's possible because uh, you want to know what it feels like before you buy it. I've uh, tried casting some rods that uh, people showed me, and they're, they're stiff as a board and very difficult to use. So um, actually casting the rod really makes a difference. Now, the rods are actually marked, like on the right-hand side, six weight, nine foot, and four-piece rod. And that's a rod that is uh, um, one of my favorites for going out on, on the lakes with. Um, if you're only going to use a rod rarely, um, if you're only going to go out once or twice a year, you don't need a really great rod to do that with. You want to get something that's very economical. And as Rich was talking before, talk to him about what is available in the storage room. Um, but otherwise, buy the best you can. And uh, a lot of the volunteers and vets have experience and talk to them and find out what it is they like to use. The fly rod parts are the reel seat and the buck section, which are right here. And uh, the butt section can be long if you have a two-handed casting rod or it can be fairly short. Um, and then the handle. And then the first thing you come to is this little button here, which is actually a hook keeper. I had a student one time put the fly line through there. And as you probably can guess, uh, the line would not go out and uh, got hung up very quickly. Then the first guide that your line goes through is a stripping guide. And if you have a heavy duty one, you may have at least two stripping guides to pull the line through first. And then it goes through these serpentine or these snake guides. And those guides actually uh, allow the line to go nice and smoothly through. And when you join the rod pieces together with these ferrules down here, um, if you're going to be using uh, the old fashioned steel to steel co connections or metal to metal connections, I like to put a little lubricant on that connection. I'll even put that piece, that ferrule in the corner of my nose to get a little lubrication because they can get really stuck together if you're not careful. Um, and the tip top <laughs> that also one. Do a COVID <laughs> test? <laughs> the, the fishing rod doesn't catch anything. <laughs> the, last, yeah. <laughs> the last guy 
The last guy is the tip top guy, and that's where the line goes out from. All right. Reels, backing line. Of course, again, they come in many classes. You can get a one, two weight, a three, four weight, five, six. Each one of those reels is designed to hold enough backing, the day crown or whatever line it is, um, and then your fly line. And so it, you don't want to have it overfilled, and you need to have somebody put that on there for you if you have any trouble at all. Um, if you're in the store, a lot of those guys house, and, and they'll actually fix it up the way you need it to be. But the main purpose of this reel is to hold the line. Um, a lot of the new reels actually have drag systems built into them. My first uh, fly fishing reel had no drag whatsoever. And uh, then you have to control a, a heavy running fish with your, your fingers and you give it a little friction like the drag would do. Um, but it also helps to have the drag tied up, tightened up a little bit so that when you're pulling the line out at first, it doesn't just overspool and backlash on you. As with rods, buy the best you can. Um, but just remember that the reel doesn't do much for you except hold the line. Uh, and the line comes in many weights um, and styles. The top one on the, on the right-hand side is actually level taper and it actually has no taper at all and that's almost never used anymore but they it's still available uh the next one is the weight forward line and it has a a taper on both ends of it but this this section here is is actually heavier than all the rest of the line so that it can carry that fly and your tippet and and your uh leader out to the fly with the fly and then you have a double taper. The only time I use the double taper is on my uh, skinny water fly reel, about a, a three weight. And with the double taper, it, it uh, impacts the water much more quietly. And uh, it, <coughs> excuse me, and it takes a little getting used to. If you're not accustomed to uh, fishing with something other than a weight forward line, um, you need to practice with it all out. Now your your weight forward floating line is where most people start. And, and I fish almost exclusively with a weight forward floating line. And the price ranges anywhere from $20 to over 120, depending on what you want to buy. Um, and so there's a lot of different things to think about. Do you want to have a, uh, a line that goes out long, long distance if you're, if you're trying to cast? And, uh, in competition, then you want a shooting taper. Uh, if you want a line that's going to sink for you, uh, it can either be a sinking tip, which is just the last bit of the line sinks slowly, or you can hit a full sink line where the entire length of the uh, line will sink at the same rate. Um, and you can buy just tip ends that you can put onto the end of your, your line that will offer sink characteristics with a floating line. Um, that's just about all I had to talk about and let's go back to here and stop share. You know, the fishing rods, fly rods started out as a piece of wood that was tapered and sanded down and shaved down and then they came out with the bamboo rods, but somewhere in the middle of all of that, I actually picked up a, a flexible fly rod that's made out of metal. And uh, I don't want to scratch it up and find out what it is, but it's a seven and a half foot fly rod with a combination spinning reel option on it. Uh, and I've actually caught fish with it. I've caught Apache trout with that little rod. And it was just kind of fun to have a, looks like a piece of bronze or something like that. Um, and then I've got bamboo rods. Uh, I, I started out most of my fishing with a, uh, fiberglass rod and uh, those are coming back into vogue. A lot of people like a fiberglass rod, uh, just for the feel of it. Um, but most of, almost all of my rods are made out of graphite and you can get the graphite 
to come in a style that's actually going to fit the, the feel that you want to have. And uh, if you go to a store like, uh, grab out of the air, Cabela's, uh, and you meet, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Robin. Robin works in there three days a week. You go see Robin, he'll go outside with you and let you try several rods so you can get a feel as to how that rod will work for you. Uh, I think it's important. Yes, um, um, I actually went to Bass Pro Shop to purchase a new rod because I had broken off the tip of my old one. Yeah. And um, when I was in there looking at rods, the guys that, that were in there were like, I really wish, they said, I really wish we could line one up and take it out to for you to be casting, but they couldn't right now because of COVID. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Oh. So some shops might have little restrictions on that. Just yeah. saying right now. Well, you know, and, and there's, there are those among us who have more rods than we should have <laughs> and um, are very willing to share. Um, if you want to try something that I have sometime when we can do that again, uh, I'd be glad to let you try the rods I have just so you get a feel for them. I will not let Boy Scouts try my fishing rods anymore. No. I bet there's a story no. there. <laughs> yeah well yeah the last two times i did uh, broken tips yeah. yeah i i had my rod laying on a table while i'm talking to them and this kid had his i don't know what you call it but it was a little wooden stick like a walking stick that was real heavy and it just happened to fall right straight across the end of my rod <laughs> and nobody acknowledged it Oh, well, that, that's another story. Yep. 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 Twice I let little kids take my rod and go to show their mom and dad the fish they caught with it or the teacher. And twice they got stepped on. I, something I do do is I buy a rod that has a warranty. You know, I like the uh, TFO rods because they guarantee their rods. I like Sage because they guarantee. A lot of the main manufacturers will guarantee if you have a problem with it for a small price, you can send it in and they will replace it or repair it and you won't have any trouble with it at all. So warranties make a big difference to me because I've had, when I used to teach the classes for game and fish, it was important. Mm -hmm. Fly lines though are the part of the whole thing that starts the equation. You've got to get a balanced setup and balance and that's where the most economical setup is. When I was working with the, the fly rod shop all the time, the median price or the average price of a good rod started at $150. But you can get a very usable rod and reel and line and everything put together for less than 100. You don't have to go that heavy duty uh, cost. Um, and I really don't encourage you to do that. Um, there's a lot of beginner rods out there. Orvis puts them out. A lot of the manufacturers are realizing there's entry level people who want to have something to try that's not going to cost them an arm or a leg. So, any questions? I would also add, Bill, that for most people, it'll be a long time before you outgrow that basic setup if you yes. get a decent one in the first place. That's. Um, the fact that it's all balanced makes a big difference. And, right. You know, it, as I say, you won't outgrow it that quickly. No, I used the same rod for many That's years right. before I moved on to other rods. Yeah. You know, my first fly rod was a Cortland kit. Yep. Okay, with a reel that had no drag, like you were talking about before. One of their 444 lines, fiberglass, and I probably fished that thing for 10 years before I replaced it. And I still have it. Wouldn't give I it actually had one of those rods rebuilt for me, refinished, and all the guides redone. And mm -hmm. I love it. It's a, it's a wonderful old rod. Yep. Be careful. Ask somebody to help you before you buy one. Yeah. I'm sorry. I missed what? Ask before you buy if you don't know. 
because my yep. first one yep. I bought was a joke. Yeah. Now, just because something is inexpensive doesn't mean it's bad. It just has to be balanced and it has to function right. I have a rod and reel set up in my closet that I have not used yet. I was hoping one of my grandkids would want to do it. And it's a Fluger setup and it's well under $100, but it is a decent setup for a kid to learn on. Even big kids. How's that? Even big kids. Okay. <laughs> well, Fluger is one of those companies that's been in business since the 1800s, making different fishing reels. And now they've also come out with some fly rod setups. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is very interesting for everybody. Yep. My first, um, my first Bill, rod. Would you talk? Pardon? Just a second. Go, Go ahead, ahead, Jim. Uh, my first rod was a... Uh, seven and a half foot fiberglass South Bend rod that I bought over on Third Street and McDowell. There was a little little uh, fishing shop there years ago. And uh, I used it. I used that rod for 35 years. I mean, I, I had some other rods since then, but, uh, uh, and I broke the tip of it, broke it in, more than broke the tip. I broke the half uh, second section, and but I've still got the base of it in my in my closet right now. Uh, the old South Bend fiber guy. I have a South Bend mm -hmm. cherry wood fly rod that's fiberglass. Oh boy! Mm -hmm. And I I can't tell you how long I bought my brother one too. I was at the Air Force Base in South Dakota. And they had him on sale for 30 bucks. I don't know if he has his, but I still have mine. <laughs> I think that's about what I paid for that for that one back there in the 40s was about 25 or 30 dollars. I had a paper route, didn't make all that much money. I saved up for and got that fly rod. Yeah. You know, the other thing too is if you if you look around a little bit, you can find some deals. And there's a lot of stuff available. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. My first reel was a Fluger automatic reel, and I still have it, <laughs> and it still works. They do work. They do mm -hmm. work. So, but you have to fiddle with that spring tensioning knob. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. We have a bunch of those, by the way, that are in the storage. Most I have some if have you want some, I'll give them to you. That, uh, the lines haven't been out of the spool for, uh, oh, I don't know, a decade or two. So they're probably pretty brittle, but uh, some of those reels are still working. The, sp the main spring still works in them, so that's, yeah. that's half the battle. <laughs> Free to anybody that asks. <laughs> Bill, uh, I've got a question for you. Oh. What's that? I've got a question for Bill. Yes, okay. Sir. Can you talk a little bit about real arbor size and yeah, the benefits I'm, and cons of such a setup? Yes. Um, typically, your arbor size, if it's large, it puts less coils into your line as you spool it in. Um, I have I have a five weight reel or setup that I put a seven eight weight on just so I could re retrieve the line easier when I was done fishing. Uh, it's a little bit cumbersome on the end of that five weight rod but it works. Um, the arbor being the center now uh, it's important that you tie an arbor knot to attach your backing to that reel to start with and that's why I suggest you go to a place where they'll actually spool the line on for you uh, the machines will spin that line. They'll put it on level left and right. But the big thing is you, you don't want to have too much backing on so that you end up with um, your line way out to the end, the edge of the reel. Because if, if you're fighting a fish and you're not paying attention to where the line is, you can lock up a reel by putting too much line on one side of it. True. Nobody's ever else. I'm not the only one that's ever done that. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, mm -hmm. No. In there. <laughs> yeah, I actually had to take all the line of backing off a of reel mm -hmm. once because I had like about 50 yards too much backing. And the backing hasn't got any size to it at all, but it was amazing how poorly I could fish with that reel when I got excited. But yeah, there's a lot of different sizes. It, it's a, I can't tell you how many different kinds of line. If you look at just um, scientific anglers, just as one example, you have hundreds of choices in what kind of line to use. And that's why for the first time out angler, I really encourage you to go with weight forward, floating line in a basic category you don't have to spend tons and tons of money for a fishable setup um i I've, I've actually bought the 20 dollar setups that are 25 dollar setups they have it's the got the backing and the fly line at uh, cabela's and that's perfect it works exactly the way i want it to work bill to to mary's yeah. point to Mary's point, if all other things are equal and you had the choice of buying a reel that was, uh, you know, an attractive size or one that's a little bigger, would you recommend buying the one that's a little bigger to get away from the problems you're talking about? I think that that's a good choice. Um, normally, if, if you're dealing with a reputable store, they will figure that out for you. Uh, the line will come with it. Uh, there's there's charts that tell them how much backing to put on for each weight line for each spool. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of spools used to or reels used to come with double spools. Now, if in some cases that was worthwhile, but for most people, having a second spool, it, you left it in the closet and you never pulled it out to the light of day again. Um, so unless you have in mind that you're going to have one spool is going to be your weight forward floating and the next spool is going to be your uh, intermediate intermediate sink line um, it's kind of a waste of time to get extra spools uh, i've done it so i'm guilty of getting stuff that i don't use but once every five years yeah you can also use the extra spools uh, which I have done uh, for a different weight of floating line. Yes. Okay, so that you only have to buy one frame and the spools are a lot less expensive. Uh, for instance, I have a three weight spool for my one of my Orvis reels and a five weight yes. on an alternate spool. So it works out really quite well. Uh, also, those most of the manufacturers will have a chart like you're talking about as to how much backing you put on and with a particular line. And most yes. of them, like a five weight floating line, it'll say uses 125 yards of 20 pound uh, backing for that particular spool size. Yes. Uh, I've even gone, I, I enjoy the feel of a good overweighted rod. And what I mean by that is I will put on uh, eight weight fly line onto my seven weight rod because it will cast that line far, it'll load the rod better. Um, some of the fly lines that are out there, uh, I think Rio Gold is one, is a half weight heavy for that same purpose. And if you need to have better feel on your rod, an extra heavier line can help you with that. Yeah. Um, Bill, no, could no, you no, talk no. a little bit about the physical balance of a rod and how that affects your casting and all? The weight yeah, of the you reel, know the, you get a real heavyweight reel on a, on a lightweight rod, it, it upsets the balance? It can. Um, most of your modern reels are made with aluminum or they're made with a, a lighter material that's that's drilled and, and machined thinner. And what you end up with is uh, if you have too heavy a reel, you're, you're, you're going to wear yourself out with some of your casting. Um, you want to have... 
let me back up a little bit. If you can match everything, you're far better off than trying to experiment with new things. Um, you want to have, I like to put my finger where the end of the handle joins the rod itself. And that rod should balance on the end of your finger at that point. And that means you're not going to be wearing yourself out really hard casting uh, to get the line to go where you want it to. So uh, that balance is real important. Get that balance to be out right where the tip of your, the top of your thumb should be on the handle out next to the rod where it starts out of the handle. Good. Yeah. And the big I, thing yeah. is don't use your whole arm. You, you should not wear yourself out casting. You should be able to just almost turn with your shoulder to get the, uh, the rod to go where you want it to go. People get into trouble getting their elbows up and doing all kinds of baseball throws with the rod and the reel, and that's not going to help you. You need to let that rod come back smooth, wait for the line, back smooth throw. A smooth cast is far better for you than trying to force a cast. And if you're forcing a cast, a lot of times you get those little things called wind knots from a trailing loop. That extra push to get the line to go out is going to get your line to wrap around itself and give you trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, uh, Joan Wolf talks specifically about the arm engagement and how you use your arm uh, during that basic uh, video that I showed before. So right. does Cinda Howard in hers, and so does the guy from Orvis. And I thought it was really interesting that all three of them addressed that about the position of your arm and your hand and how much wrist you use and all that kind of stuff. So it's obviously important is my point. So yeah. if you get and a chance to look your wrist those does... videos, check them out because yeah. they specifically address those things about the movement of your arm and the angle of your wrist, et cetera. They each address it a little bit differently, but they all address it. So that says yes. it's important. Yes. And Another person you really should watch is Lefty Cray. Yes. Uh, Lefty left us a year and a half ago, I think it was, and uh, he he was the uh, the father the father time of fly fishing. He mm -hmm. uh, started off mostly with saltwater fishing, if I remember correctly, but uh, Lefty has slightly different um, approach to it, and uh, I enjoy watching the comparisons of Lefty and Joan and, and, and the other guys. Uh, another good source is Mad River Outfitters. And I can't think of the guy's name that does his stuff, but he talks about everything you want to know, including how to pick out a light, a rod, and all the rest of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how it to tie a knot. A, uh, I meant to bring it up earlier, but they there's also a website called Chucking Fluff. And they, that's the name of the website. <laughs> it's a, kind of a funny name, but they do a lot of really good in-depth uh, comparisons of equipment. Everything from how to pick out your first fly rod to the kits that we have talked about to comparisons of rods and reels. Um, they will do a thing, um, you know, what's the, the best new rod of 2020 kind of thing. A lot of information uh, that you can also uh, take a look at there. Almost too, in, too much information in some cases. Okay, but there's a lot of details there. I was just looking up balancing a rod. And I saw buying a balanced rod set up in, uh, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, so it, there's a lot of information out there. Just you have to wade yourself through it. And sometimes it's uh, uh, tongue-in-cheek where they're, they're joking with you. And if you're not familiar with that, It'll confuse you. Um, there was there was a guy did a website on a, a show on how to catch catfish with bars of soap. Mm -hmm. 
And the joke was, you can't. I can believe it. Yep. Well, Question. good. Other questions, yeah. Mary? Yep. Um, Bill, you had talked about the um, overweighting uh, using a heavier line on a lighter weighted rod. Yes. Is that, can you describe the effect that that has on say a fast action rod, a medium action rod, a slow action rod, that sort of thing? Sure. Um, the, the, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you more of a slow action presentation, which is uh, probably more traditional, no matter which of those three setups you have. Overweighting your rod is going to make you wait a little longer until that rod loads because you need that weighted line to actually have put the spring in their step and put that, that yes. Um, there was another thing that they called it, and I was trying to, I have notes here. <laughs> but it, it's, um, it's actually putting the, like a slingshot, you're, you're pulling back or a bow and arrow, that rod is loading like that spring action of the, the bow and arrow launching the arrow, launching the, uh, the uh, fly line. And like the arrows, you have to balance the strength of the bow to the length of the arrow, to the weight of the arrow, to the stiffness of the arrow. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that you really shouldn't have to worry about. But with a fly rod, if you step up just one weight, it's not going to throw everything off. It's going to slow things down a little bit. It's going to help you cast that line because now all of a sudden you, there's, you should not ever just uh, violently throw the line like you might do with a bait caster or a spin cast reel. You're going to have to go forward smooth and a, an acceleration to a stop and let the line go out and let that rod actually flex and push that line out for you. So yeah, if you do it with a, a fast action graphite or a medium action graphite or a slow action traditional feel like you have on a bamboo rod, you're going to have to slow down a little bit more and it's going to give you a, it's going to help you cast in my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, you'll, you'll actually feel everything happening better with a little bit overweighted line. I think that's something people really need to realize is you're going to get to the point where you're going to feel that line back there. You're not going to have to look and see if the line is straight. Of course, if you hear that snap, you know that your fly left the county and you have to tie another one on. Um, so a little bit over overweighted line is going to help you solve some of those problems. Any other thoughts on that? Has anybody else done a heavier line? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yep, and it definitely does help you load the rod. Yeah. Now if you go too far, you're not gonna be able to get the line to go out because the rod can't handle it. But if you step up a half a, half a weight or a one whole weight, go from a five to a six weight, go from a six to a seven weight, that one step will help you without damaging anything or, or messing up your cast. It will actually help your cast. Yeah, the only thing that I've noticed when I've gone up a weight is that uh, the line seems to land a little bit harder on the water surface. Mm, okay. Okay, and that's probably because I'm overcompensating for it, but uh, that little bit of extra weight can cause a little bit more motion on the surface, which can spook fish. Well, and, and that's why with a, a lightweight rod and, and a, a small stream, I like using the double taper mm -hmm. point too. Uh, not made out of your uh, thread, but made out of uh, monofilament. And they will actually float and present a, a dry fly on a skinny water, or skinny, I mean shallow water, um, and you're, you're not going to spook fish as much with a, a double taper, furl leader, and then tip it on the end of it. 
again, my opinion. Mm -hmm. But it works for me. Yep. Good. Anybody else got questions or comments? Thank you, Bill. Great job. Appreciate it as always. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. My 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 only wish is that you all would get out and fish. You know, get to a local stream or a pond. Uh, mm -hmm. They're stocking trout this week in most of the local ponds. Uh, the, the trout that I encountered yesterday up at Paloma were incentive-sized trout. We're talking 18-inch trout. I was surprised. I didn't bring a net. I, <laughs> I, I had to rely on the other guys that were out there. Hey, I got something. You have a net? <laughs> wow. Good. Good. All I right. went fishing with Sam on the 29th of October, and we went up yeah. to Oak Creek, and we went to okay. Call of the Canyon. Sam was killing it, killing it. He had 14 on, landed 12, wow. and the biggest one was probably about a 18-inch Gila, he was nice. thinking. Nice, nice. Wow. He did Mary? awesome. <laughs> Where Where'd about go, on Oak Creek was that? Call of the Canyon, kind of up towards the top end. It was maybe oh, about okay. a few miles past Grasshopper Point. Yep. Yeah, good. Cool. All right. Next, I'm going to be asking for suggestions for our next class. What would people like to learn about? When can we meet? When is COVID over? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you had asked something I could answer. <laughs> no clue. Can I say soon? We'll have a big post-vaccine party. <laughs> yep. That's going to be part of it, I'm sure. Yeah, that, uh, as I said earlier, National is working on that. Um, we believe that what they're going to do in phase two is um, have, be allowed to have groups of under five participants in veterans, five people total. And then phase three would up that number to 10. Um, when that's going to happen is completely dependent on how they, the pandemic progresses. How and about just the, a possible uh, outside barbecue or something? At this point, we are restricted. We have been told that we cannot have any activities that are healing waters where we have any one-on-one -on -one contact between any of the participants or the volunteers. Now, if people want to get together for a private gathering of some kind, there's nothing to prevent that from happening. But it cannot be something that, for instance, that I would send out an invitation um, and get a, a number of people together. I just can't do it. Okay. Or we're, or, or we're uh, they're legal to folks and they're insurance people and everything has told them no don't do it okay mary you were going to comment um or some or some impromptu gathering where uh project healing waters equipment would be used that's a no-no as well depending upon what the equipment is um the answer is no okay um you know, rods and reels, we could probably do, but we cannot um, arrange it in advance. Okay. Okay. So uh, the better way to handle that would be to borrow some equipment from someone personally. Okay. Okay. Uh, with that stuff that I, I showed this chart before and I sent out uh, earlier, um, 
what we'll do is sometime in December, first, hopefully the first week in December, we'll start to distribute that stuff one piece at a time, uh, very quietly. And uh, they have told us that we can distribute those materials. So there's just gonna have to be a very brief meeting outdoors, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one with masks and distancing as best we can. And that's about all we can do. But we could not have, for instance, a casting lesson, okay, where there would be exposure from between two people for an hour or something. You know, that's that's just not gonna work, okay. Hey, it's Rich, it's really a pretty slippery slope at this point, trying to figure this stuff out, what we can and can't do. And we just have to be very cautious. Do a picture or something like that, is that okay? I'm sorry, Tony, I couldn't hear you. If Mary and I wanted to go fishing or something, is that okay? As long as it has nothing to do with Project Healing Waters. Yes, okay. that's between two individuals. Don't tell me about it. All right. <laughs> but you might send me a picture afterwards that says, hey, I caught this huge fish. Okay. You know, that I'd be okay with. <laughs> but beyond that, no, I'm afraid not. Um, as I think I told you during our last meeting, one of the program leads that's been in California for a very long time, a uh, very knowledgeable guy, was terminated from his position in Southern California because he arranged to have three people get together. Okay, so the guy that had been in the had been a program lead for about five years at least. Came very well thought of. So they're very serious about this is the point. And they're so serious because they know how serious this condition can be. And they wanna keep everybody healthy. Okay. This is, I know, we're all tired of it. I get it. <laughs> Believe me, I get it. But um, it's, it's what we have to live with right now. So. We'll just keep focusing on what's uh, what's better days ahead. Okay. So, ideas on what to talk about next time. What do you think? Well, maybe Bill can do a cooking show from his house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I got some lutefisk on the way. You know. Oh, Bill, can I come over and have some? <laughs> How about some of those 18 inch trout that you let go? I let them go. Yep. They would fit you know, in the a grill. trout like that is a trout like that is worth far more to be let go and be caught again than just one person catching it. Um, they're just too valuable. I disagree. I, agree. I think it would be pretty tasty. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you caught six, and if I take two, you'll have a black guy. It works. I have no trouble with you doing <laughs> that. None at all. I honestly, I I catch fish sometimes that I really want to keep, and if it's trout, I want to smoke it. Now that's not rolling it up in a, a, a paper. That's. Uh, <laughs> I like alderwood and applewood smoke, and I uh, marinate my fish with a uh, uh, apple sauce, no, apple juice and lemon juice and water and salt mixture. That's good. Uh, I, that's all. I can, it, it's good. <laughs> you have to be hungry, Bill. <laughs> yeah, next time we'll, just, we'll just stand out in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a drive by pick up a taste <laughs> <laughs> really yep count me in me mm. too um okay i got a, a message here from todd and he asks uh is there any water safety that we can go over in a future meeting and Norm, I know that you were working on updating our water safety program. Uh, yep. Have you got anything that uh, has been firmed up that you'd like to share with us in a future meeting? Um, 
Well, let me let me just first put it, Todd's question in some context. Uh, we will work towards uh, putting together, and and I haven't done anything uh, since we talked. Uh, we're towards putting a presentation together, Todd, but there's nothing in class that would get you certified. That has to be in the pool. Um, and, and so that part has to wait till we get warm water or we get get our program up and Gary's pool warmed up. But You have warm water. <laughs> <laughs> Says Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have some hot springs. <laughs> the, the, uh, actually, if Fledger was here, I'd, I'd bring up the fact that you don't need hot water because poor Fledger got to be our, our first of spring demonstrator, and I think I damn near froze him to death that first day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's mentioned that once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize how cold it was until I got in at the end. <laughs> I have a question so, for you, Norm. Yes. If uh, somebody <laughs> knows that they wanted that their that their certification was expired and they've got a pool app available, if they were to videotape the different parts of them doing the different parts, would that qualify? Uh, that's way too hard, Mary. I would say no. Okay. Uh, you know, quick and dirty. Uh, if you can arrange a pool, we might be able, and, and this again is post vaccine, when we can get people together. If you could arrange a pool, we could probably arrange some, some note takers, uh, instructors, demonstrators, whatever. But uh, but I would say doing it on your own video and all, no. Okay. It'll be done. Okay. <laughs> is there any thought? items is there any items that we could go over just to help keep us safe while we're out in the water or wait um, using waders, even though we're not legally certified, but just some mm -hmm. good tips or things that we could go over. Um, um maybe well I'll tell you what, maybe Mark uh, giving his uh, talk uh, on one of the education sessions. Um, he's our waiter safety guy. Sure. He's a certification guy, but he's the guy on the, in, the, in the river who's telling you how to be safe. So. <laughs> well, uh, I stand downstream with a long pole to catch those that float yes. by. Yes. That's right. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're a team, Bill. <laughs> that, that has to be Debbie. Is that you, Debbie? That, that's me, Norm. <laughs> no. yeah, Debbie's our pop pop fizz fizz. <laughs> no you know the expression, it. get the hook? <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh. that's, a, that's a great, that's a great uh, idea is whether it's you know in the floater if it's on a waiting if you're doing whatever on the water search maybe having a short powerpoint presentation yep. you know, to uh present on these education classes okay how about january yes <laughs> that work? okay we can do that um i've made a note here nor uh, uh -oh. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, I can also tell you, going back to YouTube again, if you look at the Orvis site, they have got a really good video on safety on waiting. And they actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, show you where the mistakes are made and what happens. Okay, people floating down rivers. Okay, so have a, I don't remember the exact details of it, but jump on a YouTube again, or on the, the Orvis site in their education area, and uh, take a look at that, especially if you're going out soon. Uh, same with, uh, same with Sims, Rich. I'm, I'm Sims sure they has have it. Yep. Very good videos on waiting, safety. Yep. Yep. Mark? Yeah. 
like to know um, where to catch fish, where to, how to, how to read the waters for where, so it's in the chat room. Edmund put yeah. something in the chat. Or on our YouTube channel. Yeah, I, I was going to say maybe Mark could, could make a selection, uh, see sure. what's closest to what he thinks is our common sense or his common sense. Uh, yeah, <laughs> in, the, in these other programs, because they, yeah. they're not all exact. This is this is somewhat of an inexact science, and we've developed what we think is appropriate for Arizona. Looks like Abe yeah. Lincoln. Yep. <laughs> hey, watch it. You do. You know, it's 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 one thing to talk about the waiting and go over the videos, but for doing this for the last five years, the moment they step in the water and go, oh shit, these rocks are slippery, and this That's current right. is more than I ever <laughs> thought, and yep. I'm going, no, it's nothing compared to what it yep. could be. <laughs> yeah. Yep. There yep. is something to be said for actual in the water. Yep. There uh, is practice, absolutely. Which, when we get the release, we can definitely do. <laughs> we but, can do it. Yeah, I would. I would say it's a definitely a good suggestion for in the meantime. Exactly. Well, we we can get some of the the preliminary stuff out of the way in the meantime. The there's no uh, there's no substitute for being in the water and <laughs> trying it out. It's as simple as that. You know, we got to do that. Uh, okay, uh, Ed Shelley asked, I would like, or commented, I would like to see identifying locations of fish, common signs to cast to, also an eventual fish identification class or resources to identify fish. Good comment. Yeah. Really good. Thanks, Ed. Um, it's kind of reading the water. Uh, whether it be on, uh, you know, large rivers or small streams, they vary widely. So that's a good, uh, good topic for uh, a class at some point. As far as fish identification, I've already got a PowerPoint together on that. Good. Oh, good. What are you awesome. doing in December? <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> You know, I was look at my calendar here. Yeah, I've been uh, keeping track of my fishing days and what kinds of fish and how many fish I've caught for the whole year. And I don't think I can fish again until January. <laughs> really? Really. There's that much stuff going on with the family and such. Yep. Okay. Well, I should be able to put something together for December. Our next meeting will be, uh, well, three weeks from today. It's the 17th again. So, Rich. No, 15th. Magda um, put a question. Oh, 15th. I'm on Thursday. Yeah, you're right. Magda put a question in there about, um, anyway, in, in the chat room, she's got a question. You can get the information that you're asking for in the game and fish regulations. And most of the parks that you fish at will have a sign that tell you what you can keep. Right. Yep. yep. Okay. There's, there's only one city park that I know of that actually, and that's the uh, repairing area where they only allow you to keep certain fish. Um, you know, otherwise, it's catch and release only. But when game and fish is stocking these ponds, they stock them with fish they expect you to catch and take home. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, the Riparian uh, Preserve down in Gilbert has got uh, slot limits, I believe, on bass, and uh, everything else has to go back in the water. I think you're allowed to keep trout because that's put in there strictly for put them in and take them out. Uh, all the lakes that are city ponds that are on the community waters. The bass have to be at least 13 inches long to be able to keep one. Okay. Yeah, good. And and your wider more has to be at least 30 inches long, wider than the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
everybody knows how to catch brown trout. <laughs> <laughs> there we go again. <laughs> yeah, Magda asked about that. And uh, yeah, you know, your pamphlet uh, that you pick up on the fishing regulations that is published by Fish and Game has got that stuff too. And you know, I keep a, a copy of it in my truck uh, because you can't get to the internet on all the time and be able to check their website. But that paper is pretty infallible. Okay? And it's, uh, it's free. So that will tell you about, you know, where you are, what you can catch, what you can keep, what size limits and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, Frank Scaletti says, I would like to thank everyone for your support in the fly tying and rod building competition. And Frank, you are very welcome. Glad we could help. <laughs> and great job on your win. That's terrific. And hopefully we'll be celebrating the win on the rod building as well. All right. Um, Magda, you can get that uh, pamphlet at just about any place that sells certainly licenses, uh, fishing licenses, any of the sporting goods stores, um, let's see, certainly Bass Pro and Cabela's, as well as uh, Sportsman's Warehouse, any of those places will have the fishing game uh, regulations. There's yeah, probably even Walmart. A new one. Of course, in fishing game, you can get it too if you want to go up there. Um, there are, there's one for the urban fisheries, I believe, and then there's one also for the rest of the state. Okay. Yes. Yes. Is that correct, Bill? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. And this is, this is a resource that's unbelievably useful. It tells you when they're going to put what kind of fish into the ponds. And if you don't know where the pond is, you can click on the name of the pond. It'll give you a map and tell you how to get there. And where they plant the fish. Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, for instance, if you were, uh, I recently looked at the one on Oak Creek, and there's about 18 places on Oak Creek where they plant fish. Yes. Okay. And the longer rivers and, and all multiple places. I don't know how accurate they are, but they sure look accurate. And from what I've seen when the truck has been there, I've looked them up on the map, and sure enough, there they are. Very good resource. Yeah, if you go to some place like Tonto Creek, they put fish wherever there's a pool deep enough to hold fish. Yep. And kind of the same thing with Oak Creek. Yeah. Yep. And where they can get the truck reasonably close. Yes. That helps. Too. And they get they actually carry them in in buckets and bags if they have to, to get fish into those places. It's a fact, yep. Yeah, good. All right. We're about, uh, well, we're running over like we usually do, but <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> this has been good discussion and it's been great to, to talk with everybody. And, uh, Unless we've got any other comments or questions, I think we'll wrap it up for tonight. Yes. All right. I want to wish you all a wonderful Thanksgiving. I hope you can get more than three people in the house at a time <laughs> or whatever you're doing. Uh, be safe on the road, especially if you're traveling. And Gary, again, congratulations on your uh, retirement coming up and safe travels. I appreciate that. Okay. Oh, Gary! Where are you going? <laughs> Good to be you going? I'm staying local, but I'm just <laughs> up and working. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, guys. Good to see you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too, everybody. Bye, Jet. Bye. Bye.